Hello everybody and welcome to part two of two presentations on facial bones trauma. So this is a continuation of facial bones part one. So this time we're going to look at the fault fractures and then we're going to focus on the mandible and the temporomandibular joint. Lefort identified three principal lines of fracture reflecting relative area of weakness within the facial skeleton. Uh, all of these injuries must involve the pterygoid process, which can only be appreciated on the lateral view. Generally speaking, Le Four one injury tends to be encountered in its pure form, whereas a pure Lefort 2 and Lefort 3 injury are very rare and are usually combinations of injuries. Now, clinically, these patients will have had significant trauma and therefore the most likely outcome is that these patients will have a CT. So don't get too um, worried about these injuries. I just want you to be able to understand what each type uh, represents, what type of fracture it is. So let's just move on. So a Lefort one, as we can see, is a transverse fracture and they're at the base of the maxillary sinuses. So they separate, the fracture separates the alveolar process of the maxilla from the, uh, the maxillary sinuses and the nasal fossa. So clinically, when you palpate somebody, their upper, their, their maxilla will be freely movable in relation to the rest of the face. And this is a transverse fracture, what we can see here. So a Lefort 2 fracture is when a direct blow is directed centrally or maybe just slightly inferiorly towards the central portion of the face. And so then you get this large, roughly triangular uh, or pyramidal uh, fracture of the central portion of the face, which is why sometimes it's called a pyramidal fracture. So you're looking at a fracture of the nasofrontal region down to the ethmoids, through the medial border of the orbits, through the maxillary sinuses, and remember posteriorly out through the pterygoid process. So there is complete detachment uh, of the central portion of the face. A Lefort three fracture is complete separation of the face from the calvera. And what happens is that if your patient is supine, you can get the, 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 the face because it is detached. It then displaces posteriorly, which then occludes the airways so your patient will suffocate. So what happens is that your fracture line extends from the nasofrontal area, across the ethmoid bones, uh, posterior to the infra, uh, inferior orbital fissures and across the pterygoid process. And then laterally, you're looking through the lateral wall of the orbits and the zygomatic arches. Now, a helpful clue to the underlying injury is that on a uh, projection imaging, you may actually get elongation of the orbits as the, uh, the, the face uh, detaches from the Gilvera and displaces inferiorly, creating elongation to the orbits. Here's just a slide of the PA mandible, just to remind you about the radiographic anatomy. Pause the video if you wish, otherwise just let it run and we'll move on. And here's the OPG. So again, just have a look at the anatomy, just to remind yourself, pause the video if you wish, otherwise we'll just move on. And finally, the oblique mandible, again, just remind yourself about where the anatomy sits. So we're ready to look at the abnormal cases. <laughs> 
So the temporomandibular joint is an atypical type of synovial joint. And we do open and closed views when assessing for uh, temporomandibular joint subluxation or dislocation. So what, we, what this image is going to do is to demonstrate the normal position in closed view and in open view. So if we start on the left with our right uh, TMJ, so we can see that the condyle of the mandible is sitting within the mandibular fossa. Uh, which is the normal articulation on the closed view. And then what happens is that as we open our mouth, the condyle rolls forward to sit inferior to our articular process. So here on the right side, we can see that the mandibular fossa is here. This is our articular process. And we can see how the condyle has rolled out of the fossa and is now sitting inferior to the articular process. This is normal. This is the normal location for an open view. The left side, we can see the condyles sitting within the mandibular fossa. And on the open view, here's our mandibular fossa. And we can see that the condyle has, ro has rolled anteriorly and is now sitting inferior to the articular fossa. So these are normal open and closed views of the TMJ. So now we have a line di diagram demonstrating the open and closed views of the TMJs. And what we can't appreciate on our uh, projection imaging is that we cannot appreciate the articular disc because it is radiolucent and so therefore not visible. So when we talk about open and closed views being normal, uh, we need to recognise that, that, that we cannot assess for uh, our, the, our dysfunction to the articular disc. So we can only use open and closed views to purely assess the location of the um, uh, condyle within the mandibular fossa. So now we have an open view of our APG. Now, generally speaking, it's very easy to detect if a patient has dislocated their mandible as they will come in with their mouth open and they won't be able to close it. So this is clinically pretty big <laughs> giveaway of what's wrong with the patient. But let's have a look at this open mouth view and we can see our condyles, our temporary mandibular condyles here. And we can see the location of the mandibular fossas, for fossae, I should say, sorry, the mandibular fossae and the articular eminence. And remember, in the open view, the condyles should sit inferiorly to the articular eminence. And here we can see that the mandibular condyles have moved anterior to the articular eminence bilaterally. So this is a bilateral temporary mandibular joint dislocation. So what is it? It's a dislocation where bilateral temporary mandibular joint how anterior. So the following slide does uh, has a line drawing of mandibular fat fractures and common locations. I would encourage you all to learn the anatomical areas of these common locations so that you can correctly identify uh, the injury on your and uh, on any of your X-rays that you look at. Uh, the mandible forms a ring structure with the maxilla and so therefore with ring structures there tend to be more than one injury. Interestingly the contracu injury tends to be to the mandible so it's not to the maxilla. So if you find one fracture on your mandible search carefully for your second view. Remember we always do two views particularly in the context of trauma. So you should always do an OPG and a PA mandible. I know some trusts also ask for um, oblique mandibles, 
but as a very minimum, you must do a PA mandible in addition to your APG. And if your referrer from the ED, from the emergency department, has not asked for a PA mandible, but just an APG, please just go straight ahead and do a PA mandible because you will miss fractures if you don't have two views. It is very common to only see one fracture on one view and to see the contra -coup fracture on the second view. So it's perfectly possible to not to only appreciate each different fracture on the different views. So you won't necessarily appreciate both fractures on the one view. So when you look with any mandibular injuries, you have to check both your PA mandible and your OPG to make sure that you've identified all the injuries. So here we have our OPG. A is for adequate. We have our temporomandibular joint superiorly. We have our symphysis menti inferiorly. We don't have particular elongation to the teeth. Therefore, this is a well-positioned OPG. Remember, if you have a very smiley face, this indicates that the chin has been tilted down too much. And conversely, if you have a very horizontally orientated mandible or even a sad face, then the patient's chin has been tilted up too much. OK, so A is for adequate. And A now is for alignment. The condyles of our mandible are sitting within our uh, mandibular fossa. So our alignment is preserved. There is alignment of our teeth with no evidence of, an, of overlap, indicating that there may be an avulsion to the tooth. So our alignment is preserved. Now B is for bones. So let's go round the cortex. Remember, you go round the cortex of every bone. And it's at this point in the body of the right mandible that we can see that there is an undisplaced fracture that communicates with the tooth. And this is very important. Fractures that communicate with the root of a tooth are considered to be open fractures. They are high risk of infection. So they're treated with prophylactic antibiotics. Let's continue. And remember when I was talking about the, uh, the OPG has been not uh, adequate at visualising the entire mandible. They're particularly weak around the symphysis menti. So check your PA mandible carefully for injuries to the symphysis menti. And at this point, we can see there is a step in the cortex indicating that there is a fracture through the left ramus. Let's keep going. And then there is a further fracture through the coronoid process. So we've got a comminuted fracture involving the left ramus and the left coronoid process. Just quickly check your roots, check your teeth, that you don't have any fractures through the teeth. This person's obviously had a tooth extraction, but there's still been a residual part of the uh, probably previous root canals been left in. OK, great. So we can clearly see our undisplaced fracture through the right body, our comminuted fracture through the left ramus and coronal process. And then C is for cartilage, so there's normal uh, joint articulation of the temporomandibular joint. Let's move on to the PA mandible. So now we have our PA mandible. A is for adequate. We can clearly, clearly visualise the whole of the uh, mandible, although admittedly, the uh, condyles are not well visualised because of the uh, mastoid air cells. It's slightly rotated, but it's within normal limits. So A is alignment. Yeah, the alignment is preserved. And we can again clearly see that the alignment of the teeth is well preserved as well. 
So B is for bones. Now we remember from our OPG, we had a fracture through the body of the right mandible, and we had a fracture through the left ramus and coronoid process. So let's go with B. And it is at this point you can see the lucent line of the fracture through the body of the right mandible communicating with the teeth. And this is why it's so important that if some, you know, on this particular case, we can actually visualize this fracture. But in many cases, if you see the fracture on the OPG, you may well not be able to appreciate it on the PA mandible view. Check the symphysis minti carefully. This location is particularly difficult to visualize in the OPG, so use your mandible view to assess for any lucent lines. Let's keep going. And it's at this point we can see the displaced fracture through the left ramus. And it is extremely hard to visualize the fracture through the coronoid process. OK, so we can see uh, we can appreciate uh, the subtle lucent line for the fracture of the body of the ram uh, the, the fracture of the body of the mandible. And we can see the displaced fracture through the left ramus. So what is it? It's a fracture where right body, left coronoid and ramus. How? undisplaced right body, comminuted left coronoid and ramus.